The Federal Reserve just lowered interest rates for the first time in four years. Does this change our yield farming strategy? In this video, we're going to talk about it. I'm going to explain what yield farming is. I'm going to talk about how I plan on adjusting my liquidity pools, if anything, going into Q4, Q1, Q2, uh, and just all my thoughts around it so that way you guys can you know, take this information and use it to structure your pools. Uh, obviously, none of this is financial advice. These are my own perspectives, research, and opinions and should be treated as such. So without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm going to give you guys my thoughts on the interest rate dropping. It's not what everyone else is thinking. Uh, I'm just going to tell you guys how I'm adjusting and how I think the market is going to be affected and how it's going to perform and how it could perform based on these different factors that we're looking at. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. Starting off with what is yield farming? If this is your first time watching the channel, yield farming is exactly what it sounds like. It is a way to get a yield. So it's four main ways to get a yield in crypto. You can stake your crypto on a blockchain's staking contract like E2.0, get like a 13% yield for securing the network. You can deposit your funds on a borrowing and lending platform such as Aave, and they'll pay you passive income to allow them to facilitate borrowing and lending on the platform. The third way is to stake your funds on insurance platforms such as Nexus Mutual so you can get a yield to facilitate insurance premiums. And the fourth way, the way that we're talking about in this video and the way that we always talk about in the channel, the most profitable way, is to stake your funds on decentralized exchanges like Uniswap, like Trader Joe, like Aerodrome in the form of pairs. So anytime someone swaps from asset A to asset B or asset B to asset A, you get paid passive income, right? And the amount you make is dependent upon how much your liquidity makes up in the pool. So if it's 100K in that pool and you have 10K in it, you make 10% of the trading fees since your liquidity makes up 10% of the entire pool. And if you watch any of my previous videos, you know that we believe yield firm is the best way to generate passive income in the history of the world. Okay, so now that we know what yield farming is, let's talk about my current market sentiment and how you know I may adjust based off of what's happening. So first, the Federal Reserve lower interest rates, 50 basis points, half of a percent. For the first time in four years now i want to show you guys a chart and then give you my thoughts on the interest rate hike if you look at this chart you can see that anytime the fed lowered interest rates that's when we saw the bottom in the market right and this goes back to 1969 you had them pivot and you see the market drop 36 percent they pivoted at 73 48 percent 81 27 percent 2000 51%, 2007, 58%, 2019, 35%, and 2024. Should we expect another market drop? Now, first, let me explain why they pivoted for these hikes and why it's different this time around. So I'm gonna just start with 2000, right? Because we have technology and technology just makes everything different. Everything different. So in 2000, the Federal Reserve switched from raising rates to cutting them in 2001 as the dot-com bubble burst and the economy showed signs of a recession, right? So this led to a series of rate cuts starting in January 2001. So after the dot-com bubble burst, a lot of people lost money. People didn't want to spend money. It was a lot of fear in the market. So the Federal Reserve lowered rates to stimulate the economy so that you know it's cheap to borrow money, so that businesses and people can borrow money and start spending again. Because one person's spending is another person's income, right? In 2007, you know, 2008, that's pretty much you know the real estate financial crisis that we went through. So they began cutting rates in 2007, September, after a prolonged period of rate hikes responding to the emerging financial crisis uh, and just the deteriorating economic climate. So we all know what happened with the mortgage-backed securities and everything like that. They lowered it because things were breaking. Right? These are the parallels. Same with 2019. COVID happened. We had a pandemic, and you know people businesses were shutting down. People were getting laid off. No one was spending any money. No one was making any money. So they did all these stimulus checks and all these things and they lowered rates. Okay. So this time they're lowering rates. We have the stock market at all time high. You know, Bitcoin is near all time highs. Nothing's broken in the economy. We have elections coming up, which is a whole nother thing we'll talk about in a bit. So versus the past few decades where they were lowering rates because something broke, this time they lowered rates to prevent something from breaking. We have inflation at two and a half percent, so they got inflation down. So, and this is the reason why we didn't experience an immediate sell off, in my opinion, right? And the reason why we see the bottom after the Fed lowers interest rates is because they only lower rates because something's broken and they're trying to stimulate the economy 
And smart money goes, okay, they're lowering rates. They only print money when something's going bad also. They don't like to print money, despite what people may think. They print money when they have to, right? Not when they have to, but when they have to. So smart money is looking at that like, okay, they're lowering rates because something's broken. Let me take a risk off approach. And that's why assets drop. And it's normally a V-shaped recovery because eventually people are like, all right, let me borrow some money and buy some shit on a global scale. Okay. So now that's not happening because nothing's broken. The Fed reached their goals, two and a half percent inflation. So now just going to start lowering rates. Uh, and they said they're going to lower it a few more times, right? And I'm, I was a little surprised just because it's right before elections, but it is what it is at this point. So now, where do I see markets going in the next few, in the short term? And when I say short term, I mean Q4, Q1, Q2. Now, I think it's possible that we may have one more flush out in crypto. The stock market is really hard to say. I wouldn't be surprised if it went up another 5% over the next few quarters. Wouldn't be surprised if it dropped a little bit too, but I think overall it's going to keep continuing to rise just because like, man, this is like damn near a soft landing as we speak right now, like nothing's broken. So I think crypto is going to still, I think we're still going to have the altcoin cycle and how it plays out will depend upon who gets selected. If Donald Trump gets selected, it's on and popping for sure. If Kamala gets selected, may not be as good actually will not be as good for sure 100 percent. i think so either way we have a bitcoin etf we have an eth etf i do still believe in the four-year cycle theory so i do think we're going to have an explosive altcoin rally so now let me show you guys two metrics here and now i'm going to talk about what are the best liquidity pools to be in if that's going to be the climate okay so first we have the bitcoin halving right and i want to compare the last few halvings so the halving is when the supply of Bitcoin coming onto the market gets cut in half and the market typically moons after there's a Bitcoin halving. This also coincides with global liquidity, right? So I think global liquidity is going to start increasing as interest rates are being lowered as well because people are going to start taking on more credit and that finds its way into asset classes. So it's not just based on the halving cycle and all of the previous Bitcoin halvings happened during low interest rate environments as well. Right, so this is the first time where it's a high it's a high rate environment, but rates are starting to come down, which is good. So in 2016, after the halving, Bitcoin pretty much started to moon, like 200 days or so after. Like we kind of chopped sideways before we went explosive in 2016. 2020, we saw the same thing. Now here we are in 2024. This will put us around November, December, January. I think we'll see the same thing play out or similar, especially since we have ETFs, right? Here's another metric. This is the price of Bitcoin uh, coincided with ETH on exchanges. So this red line shows the exchange balance of ETH. So it's been going down, right? Which means people are pulling ETH off of exchanges. So what does it mean when people are pulling ETH off exchanges? Well, people only use exchanges to buy and sell. A lot of people hold funds on exchanges, but after all the hacks that's been happening with FTX and BlockFi, it kind of left a nasty taste in people's mouths and there aren't as many people holding crypto on exchanges. So if you see ETH going on to exchanges, that means people are prepared to sell their ETH because why else would they just put it on the exchange? If you see ETH being pulled off of exchanges like we're seeing right now, that means people are just holding it in their wallet and they're prepared to hold it and wait for prices to go up before they send it back to the exchange to sell, right? We had EIP 1559. Another thing, Vitalik Buterin, launched the Ethereum documentary on the same day that the Federal Reserve had their meeting when they lowered rates. Coincidence? I think fucking not. And you know, like I said, we have an ETH ETF. So it's just like my my best guess is I think we'll see a 7K to 15K ETH this cycle. If it goes above 15K, I'm selling everything, like everything. So this is really, really bullish. And this trend has been going down for a long time with no signs of slowing down. Okay, so now that I kind of gave you guys my views on the market how do you go about setting up your portfolio specifically your liquidity pools uh in alignment with what could happen with with what i just talked about so there are three types of liquidity pools you have stable coin pools where you have two stable coins you have a stable coin and a volatile asset like eth usdc and you have volatile volatile pools like eth maple like we talk about all the time so since I believe we're going into a bull market, the best pools 
to be in for a bull market are volatile, volatile pairs like Maple ETH, Pendle ETH that we're going to show here. And the reason why is because what Bitcoin and ETH does, the rest of the market does as well. When Bitcoin goes up, people make money, they sell it, they start to buy ETH. ETH goes up, they sell it, they start to buy other altcoins. This is how the cycle typically plays out, even though meme coins start to moon before anything uh, in the past few months to year. But as ETH goes up, it's going to drag other altcoins up with it, especially the ones that are built on ETH or layer twos, like ETH layer twos, like Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon. So if you have two assets rising in tandem, it's good to be in a liquidity pool like that because it's easier to stay in range. Now compare that to like ETH USDC, which is still a good pool. You can use it to take profits. So it's, it's also, you can also use an ETH USDC pool to uh, yield farm in the bull market. But if your goal is to take profit, you are looking forward to it going out of range. With the volatile, volatile pool, if ETH goes up 200% and Maple goes up 200%, the line's going to be straight, but people are still trading the asset, which means it's still a good amount of volume, which means it's a great amount of fees. And once we go into an altcoin cycle and people are buying these altcoins by the droves, like the asset that people are going to buy Maple with the most will be ETH. Same with Pendle. So the liquidity providers that are in those pools will get to make all those fees, just like selling shovels during a gold rush. Okay. When one goes up, it's high likelihood that they both will versus if you're in the ETH USDC pool, if ETH goes up by 2x, stablecoin is going to stay at a dollar and it's, it's going to be harder to stay in range. So volatile, volatile pools are what I'm going to be looking at as we're going into Q4. Well, it's what I've been in, honestly, and it's been playing. It's been working out great if you guys have been watching the video and I think that will continue. Let me show you how I go about looking at it. So the most important thing when you're providing liquidity for a volatile, volatile pair is to make sure that they're correlated, meaning if one goes up, the other one goes up. So you have all these correlation tools that you can find online. And there used to be a good one where you can type the assets in, but I can't find it anymore. So this one is a uh, blockchaincenter.net. Like you see the higher the score, the better. So Bitcoin and ETH are obviously extremely correlated. You have Bitcoin, BNB, Bitcoin, Cardano, XRP, Litecoin. And the higher the score, like I said, the more likely it is that this is a good pool to get into because they'll rise and fall together, which will enable you to stay in range. Uh, here's another one where you can look at these, but I'm not even in any of these pools. So what I like to do is I like to use our Yield Hunter tool, right? And, and again, if you want to get access to this tool, I've made videos on it. Um, you want to get access to this tool, our 13-hour Yield Farming course, access to our, our coaches who do this full time and access to our community of advanced farmers and investors just in general, click the link in the description, book a free strategy session. You'll talk to me or one of our coaches. We'll answer any questions you have as it pertains to yield farm and investing. And we're happy to point you in the right direction and see if this is a good fit for you. I digress here. So this tool that we made, you get to see all of the pools. You can search by token, you can search by protocol, you can search by chain. And you can see the volume to TVL ratio. The higher it is, the better. And you can see that like layer zero ETH right now is paying 787% on optimism. Layer zero Matic, layer zero ETH. So layer zero has just been a hot pool lately for whatever reason. Another thing you look at, you wanna go and look at the chart. So this is the Maple ETH pool that I've been in for a while, right? When this chart's going up, Maple's outperforming ETH. When it's going down, ETH's outperforming Maple. So part of the reason why this is such a good pool, remember this is a volatile, volatile pair. My range has only been 86% wide and price for the most part has stayed in between it. And I have a rule that once I see a break and a retest and a nice big green candle close here, that's when it'll make me rebalance. So I haven't rebalanced. I'll see if it goes back in range. And I want to see that break and retest close here on the weekly. So if we come down and I see a nice green candle close here, I'll probably go ahead and, or I'll go ahead and uh, rebalance. But for right now, I'm staying put. Same thing happened here and it went right back in range and I didn't have to waste money on fees. Another good pool is Pendle ETH, right? And if we look at the range here, you can see that from top to bottom, it's only 150%. So I'm giving price a lot of room to go up and down. And as long as it's within this box, I'm making money. I don't care if it's here below or at the top. My whole reason for providing liquidity is just to get a yield. That's the only thing I care about. So this is how you want to go about finding your pools. You want to find the assets that you're bullish on. Look at the volume to TVO ratios. Look at the correlation score. You know, look at the chart and try to say like, okay, had I been here, 
for this amount of time, what were the yields that I could have gotten? You can back test that on metrics finance and we've made plenty of videos on that as well. So to conclude, volatile volatile pairs are the way to go. That's what I'm doing. It's what our community is doing as we're going into elections, right? I expect a lot of volatility to happen during elections, no matter who gets elected. The direction of it may be different, but nonetheless, volatility is good once you're yield firm and it doesn't matter, right? And this is why market makers make the most money in bull bear market sideways markets because they make money off of trading fees whether the market's going up or down right so i hope this video helps if it is share with a friend drop a comment drop a like let me know what you guys want me to cover next book a strategy session if you're interested in learning more and running your portfolio like a professional market maker other than that i thank you guys so much for tuning in i love every single one of you watching and i'll see you in the next video take care and trade safe